thank you very much and good morning. Um, I ought to uh, maybe just explain a little bit about my background because I'm not uh, a designer, an architect or a landscape person at all. Uh, I've lived in Hackney for the last 40 years. I was initially an English teacher and then I ran a community centre in Hackney uh, set up in 1972. And... Uh, have been very active in a whole range of kind of political issues and issues around public space and parks and libraries and so on in the borough since then. Um, but I did go and work for the GLC in the mid-80s and work with Jeff Morgan on the whole notion of the kind of cultural identity of London and was involved in setting up Demos in 1992, the think tank. So I've always taken a very social policy attitude towards the issues of how people live in London, how they go to work, how children go to school. And obviously streets and public spaces are a very important part of that. Uh, a year ago, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation asked me to, if I would do a summary of six pieces of academic research into the use of public space across Britain, uh, which we call the social value of public spaces. And this was really quite a counterintuitive piece of work because although so much about public space is about design, what all these pieces of research were finding, and they ranged across Wales, Scotland, England, big towns, new towns, London suburbs and so on, was really that the people element had kind of slightly disappeared from the whole debate. If we say that really the framework for what we call the urban renaissance was set up by this report, uh, the Richard Rogers report, I, what I found interesting about it was that there were seven people on the urban, green, urban spaces task force. Uh, two were architects, one was a town planner, one was a landscape architect, one was an economist, and I can't remember what the other two were. But there were no sociologists, there were no people from any faith communities, there were no people from any community acti activist groups. It was very much an understanding of urbanity as really an issue of design. And it's interesting and significant that the introduction to the Urban Renaissance Report was written by the then mayor of Barcelona. And key to the whole notion of the Urban Renaissance was this extended visit to Barcelona by the Urban Renaissance uh, Task Force, in which they seemed to be saying that somehow the answer to the issue of urban public space really lies around in the Mediterranean. And it was very much, remember Barcelona did this big public spaces project around the time of the Olympics. But the social conditions in which people live in Barcelona are so totally different to which they live in London or any British town that it seems that many of the lessons were not actually uh, the best ones that could be learned. Now, why are people in, so interested in public space? Well, in the last 20, 30 years, all European democracies, social democracies, have seen a shift in politics in which no longer the public sector is the main provider of most of the things, most of the services that we take for granted. In fact, we clearly do live in a mixed economy. So that I, I actually left out health, but uh, health the you know, National Health Service, wholly public sector, increasingly large elements of private sector provision coming in. It's true in transport, where the private sector, i.e. people's personal use of cars, is now the dominant mode of which people travel or access work, school, leisure, and so on. It's true in housing. You know, we're now a nation of owner-occupiers. It's true of education. There's much more a mixed economy. We've got academies and so on. And in leisure, you can also see that the notion that, you know, the old swimming bars is where the majority of people now exercise is simply not true. And the danger, of course, in this modelling of public provision is that in the end, public provision increasingly becomes regarded as provision of the last resort. Your local swimming bars, well, that's for the poor, the ones who really can't afford it. That's why the prices are cheap. That's why they have special deals for pensioners and so on whereas your modern leisure centre, your commercial leisure centre, very much aimed at the young and the beautiful. And it's true of education, housing and transport that public provision is seen as provision of last resort, which kind of then implies that really we have lost any sense that we do share some kind of commonality as citizens. And I think it's that that has made politicians realise, really, that public space is in a way the last territory 
which people actually can share, whether they are rich or poor, black or white, uh, and, and see each other as belonging to a kind of common community. And I really do think that that's the kind of the issue of public space now, the priority, why it is so important. It is the last territory in which you can say that citizenship actually matters. If you look around at London, um, this photograph was taken in Tottenham, cycling up uh, a few months ago. The key thing that anybody will tell you about the 20th century and urbanity is that everything got changed by the car. The car came to dominate the way cities worked, the way space was allocated, who got the choice of spaces, who got the... and so on. And the fact is now there are 32 million cars in Britain and four times as many cars as there are children. So the enormous displacement of people, as it were, from their right to be free and out in the public domain is really a critical issue, particularly if you do regard children, as it were, as the canaries in the coal mine, if children are becoming visible in the streets, or if the only children you see in the streets are ones you consider dangerous or feral or bad, as certain kinds of people would like us to believe, then you really do have a social problem. So finding some kind of new rapprochement between the street, the pavement and the car is very much an issue, I think, of the public realm. Uh, not far from that is the cycle lane, which I use, uh, near uh, Tottenham. I mean, this is supposed to be a kind of, presumably it's an equality in which the car has equal status to the pedestrian and the cyclist. We'll work out who knows where to go and who really does have priority. And I think this issue of the separation of I mean, it's not so strong in London, but certainly in provincial town cities, the separation of the residential areas from the commercial areas, the business districts, the retail areas, the education areas, is now astonishing. And somehow, we do have to break through this kind of almost absolute separation of functions of spaces to create flows by which residential areas can get reconnected back to the business districts, the retail areas, and so on. And this is classically a problem that I think urban design really does have to address. Not simply for design reasons, but also envir environmental reasons as well. I mean, nobody in their right mind will risk actually regarding that as a cycle path. And if you were to show this slide in Denmark or Sweden or Norway, they would just go home laughing. I mean, uh, this is not an equality of, or of peers. Parity of esteem, so-called. If, like me, you're a scandophile, um, I went to Sweden first in 1963 and kind of fell in love with the place, you realise that in a way we are talking, there are two sort of generic models of urbanism in Europe. This is, no, this is nothing new, there are books and books about this. Really, there's a kind of northern European tradition of urbanism as a Mediterranean tradition of urbanism, and they each have different histories, different, particularly around, um, and they're very religious based, actually, Protestant and Catholic, very, very strong religious influence on the way people understand their role in the public domain. Um, but you can, if you want, crudely dis, dis put it into two kinds of categories. And I think out of this mix, we ought to be able to kind of develop something that you might want to call a kind of British urbanism that does embody the best of both of these northern European and Mediterranean traditions. And they are classically exemplified in Barcelona or Copenhagen. It's lovely to go to Barcelona and get some sunshine, but if I want to cycle around and, uh, and, and do other things, actually Copenhagen, and if I were taking my grandchildren anywhere, Copenhagen's the place for me. And these two different traditions of urbanism one high rise, which is where we're heading now, uh, as compared to low rise. High density, high land values, an emphasis on the city centre and the central business district. Less interest in the suburbs in this kind of Mediterranean tradition. Much emphasis now on corporate architecture, iconic buildings. Marion's all 
already refer to these kind of high status, big bang kind of innovations that somehow, you know, the Millennium Dome, the Olympics, somehow we seem to believe that these things are kind of, kind of illuminate and democratise way of living in London. I'm very sceptical about that. But it is very much on the city as a spectacle. Loft living, I mean, Anne Powers at the LSE has, has made some trenchant criticisms of all the kind of new housing going on around the Olympics, around Greenwich and so on. It's all for childless couples. Where is the sense that we're trying to build family communities or living communities? Uh, it's, it's kind of almost become a joke that the Richard Rogers view is very much around kind of uh, cappuccinos and sitting outside in the sunshine under striped parasols. But, you know, there's more to London than that. Very much the design is around hard surfaces uh, with an emphasis on piazzas and squares. On the other hand, if you look at kind of northern European tradition of urbanism, it's much more about low-rise suburbanism, green links, pedestrianisation, cycle routes, connecting parks to each other, social housing, f a family accommodation, trying to kind of orient, orient housing policy around the families, the courtyard, the cycle areas and so on. And so I think really we do have to find a way in which we can take elements of both these traditions and kind of weave them together when we are looking at urban design issues in London. Well, this is one project um, just next to St Paul's. I suppose this is regarded as you know, high-class urban design, but I think most people who, who visit it or use it or walk through it would regard it as pretty hostile, actually, to the human being. It's rather windy, the seats are uncomfortable, there's no modification of the air quality by planting and so on. And only 300 yards up the road, there's a small park which is always heavily used by picnickers, people taking their sandwiches and so on, where the air, the, the earth is cooler and we do know the role that green, green can play in kind of changing the heat islands, you know, creating islands within islands of cities. And this really offers no kind of refuge from the noise of the city, nor any kind of change of ambience, of atmosphere, of temperature. And I do think this kind of, this kind of urban design, it looks good, it, it, it's fine for certain kinds of places, but it doesn't work often in more neighbourhood community centres. Now, the one serious attempt to understand how urban design can or cannot meet or accommodate to neighbourhood or community issues or community public space is the work done by Pauline Gallagher, which was commissioned for the, when Glasgow was City of Architecture in 1999. And they commissioned five very expensive pieces of urban design. From a com Each one was tendered for and won by an architect working with an ar artist, landscape architecture firm, or an architecture firm working with an artist, uh, for five neighbourhoods in Glasgow. And it was called the Five Spaces Project. And they were very expensive. Um, the, the design was largely fairly avant-garde, largely fairly avant-garde, uh, was largely avant-garde. And Within a year, four out of the five have been vandalised and more or less destroyed. And I think we really have to take these lessons seriously, that there are places in which urban design alone cannot produce answers to creating meaningful public space. And Pauline Gallagher asked at the end, uh, looking back at the kind of the empty spaces which had kind of failed, at what point urban design really cannot help neighbourhood spaces, that you really do have to do some um, other kinds of thinking. And that was classically one kind of um, neighbourhood space designed by an artist with a, an architect's firm. Well, you know, there's nothing to do, basically. It's, uh, it's a void within a, a void. It's, um, 
And I think we've got to get beyond that notion that design can solve social problems. It's got to work in harmony with the communities. And this is also um, the lesson from the Demos report, which again, another research report like the Roundtree Foundation work, like the work that Sheila is going to talk about quite soon. This was uh, four cities, Card four cities and towns, um, looking at where people really were during the day. And they were largely not in the new areas designed, the, the waterfronts, the quays, the new piazzas. They were actually in school playgrounds, street markets, uh, car boot sales, community centres, first uh, shore start projects, parks, of course. And that their summary is that many of the shiny new quaysides and squares seem curiously empty of people or curiously monocultural in the type of people they attract. The shift from a place-based to a user-based understanding enables the quality of space in the neighbourhood or even a whole city to be assessed in terms of how well it supports a range of public experiences. And I think this is the thing. What experiences, what are the feelings that people have when they're using these public spaces? And are we producing design that creates feelings of belonging, companionship, risk-taking, adventure, and reflection and learning? The very best of parks always produces these experiences, we know. And the very best street markets and town squares can do it as well. But we do have to have those kind of end values in sight when we are designing, not simply that it looks good on paper. We have to keep asking ourselves, what experiences can this new space and the design of this space produce? So there's now a kind of new move afoot, uh, which puts the... And I think this is very much to do with the, the preoccupation now with the childhood obesity, that really urban design has to put the child at the centre. And this book is, is rather theoretical. It's not rich in kind of good examples. But I think it makes a very interesting point for those who are interested in politics, which I am, which is that over the last 20 or 30 years, the whole debate about public space has been quite politicised. And it's very much been around completely, you know, one understands the rights of women to be safe in the streets at night, uh, the rights of gay and lesbian people, kind of making streets and cities have a lively evening culture, you know, the evening economy, the nighttime economy, and so on. But in that very adult kind of debate about why we should reclaim public space, children's voices have been silenced. And I think we really do have to bring children's issues and experiences of the street, the park, the playground. Uh, the marketplace back at the centre of urban design policy. Because the danger is, and this report it makes it quite well, that it's not that children need public space as a, re as a kind of an escape from the family. Children need both a secure family life, but they also need the communal life of the street as well. And if we don't make design attend to the needs of children, we will increasingly regard those children who are out on the streets as actually problems or ones whose families are not looking after them. And the idea that the only children out on the streets are ones whose family have let them down is a terrible thing to do because it puts pressure on the parents not to let their children out because they'll be, they'll be regarded as having failed. So the Demos work and the Roundtree work is saying that we have to look at more emphasis, putting more emphasis on everyday spaces, high streets, street markets, playgrounds and so on. And that public space, and it's a very nice phrase in the Demos report, is actually a self-organising public service. Good quality public space, well-used public space, actually solves social problems. And you can see it in all the work that she, she and others have done. Talking to old people, going out to buy shopping every day down the street market or to the local shops. They meet people. They say hello to the stallholder and so on. That is actually keeping them they're going. That's keeping their social identity alive. And 
Therefore, public space not only has this role in creating forms of citizenship, but it actually maintains people's sense of their own identity out and about. And I think the ironic thing is that all this roundtree research says that this is very counterintuitive, where the kind of Richard Rogers approach assumes that it's the rich, the young, the wealthy, those with high disposable income to spend who animate town and city centres, is actually reverse. That when you look at the Milton Keynes, the Cardiffs, uh, the Bristadors, the, you know, the Haringeys, it's the poor, it's the elderly who are out every day shopping because they don't have big cars to go to the supermarket at the weekend to shop up for the week. They go out every day shopping and they animate the streets. So actually it's the elderly in a way who are the real urban pioneers or certainly the ones who are keeping urban space alive. And lastly a very strong sense coming out of all this round tree work is that design is important but that successful public space is a co-production. It's co-produced by the designers working with people to meet the, those people's social and economic and environmental needs. And if people won't use the public space, then you have to say it, it's failed. And our definition really does have to be very extensive and inclusive, that it's all around us, it's a vital part of urban life. This is the most recent CAVE report on public space. It's a place where people can get that break from you know, the busy world of shopping or going to work and so on. Somewhere to get away from the bustle of a busy daily life. So, I think the urban design, renaissance design agenda was very important. It, it really did make politicians sit up. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. And I think this debate wouldn't be being held if it hadn't been for the urban renaissance report. But, you know, we're in a kind of second phase of it. We're now looking much more about suburban spaces and about how people can use them. We think also with the perception that childhood obesity is a growing problem, that children have to be at the focus for it. We need to strengthen the relationship between centres and suburbs. Uh, and in almost in a last way, this building health report, which has just come out, architects the whole question of, where we, what new buildings, new street patterns, all that stuff now has to put public health at the heart of it. We seem to be returning to the 1930s when public health, you know, sunshine, fresh air, all that stuff, uh, really informed planning. And I think we're coming back to that again. You know, planning, design, architecture has to have public health at its centre. Thank you. <laughs>